Good morning, everybody. Can I also ask you to, to take your seats as quickly as you can? Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. I'll just wait until the door is closed. So good morning again, everybody. Very nice to, to see you. Um, welcome both to the online audience and to those of you here in the room uh, with us. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Catherine Went. I'm the head of unit in uh, DG Rejo for Smart and Sustainable Growth. If you're following the previous session, you heard Nicola de Michele saying he's the director for many things. One of those things is Smart and Sustainable Growth and the Just Transition uh, Fund, which is within my team. So very happy to be here with you today uh, to moderate uh, the session. I'm going to say a very uh, few words uh, and then I'll bring up our panel uh, onto, the, onto the podium. So I think we, our previous session was focusing on the importance of, of partnership, of the engagement of all actors in the regions, in the development of the Territorial Just Transition pl Plans, and now in the implementation of the programs. And our session now is also about partnership, the importance of partnership at the different levels. So here we're talking about partnership at the European level, uh, the partnership that we have brought together by setting up our uh, four Just Transition Platform working groups. We set these up in, in 2021 uh, to make sure that the voices from all regions uh, could be heard, but also could be brought together here, in the, here in, in the central setting and then be able to share those best practices and those thoughts, those exchanges back in the regions. We have uh, four groups that are focusing on key uh, sectoral issues on steel, on cement, on chemicals, and we have a cross-cutting group on stakeholder uh, engagement. And these working groups have brought together key players, so representatives of national, regional, local authorities, uh, economic and social partners, NGOs, uh, academia, and, and youth. And we really see these members of the working groups as, as ambassadors of, of just transition going back in, into their regions. Uh, and of course, also, depending on the nature of the actions uh, that are discussed, we hope that the members of the groups can take forward the implementation of the actions uh, in their regions. We've given support to these uh, working groups through the uh, JTP Secretariat to make sure the meetings happened, to make sure the dialogue was, was sustained. Um, and these working groups also accompanied the negotiation of the... Um, territorial just transition plans and now are accompanying the implementation phase. What we are going to present to you today is uh, an interim, if you like, an interim um, outcome of the work of these groups, which is the uh, common implementation plan. So all of the groups worked independently. Then they came together to see where there were common issues uh, between the issues that they'd identified. And we have a common implementation plan with a number of actions. Um, in the different sectors. Uh, and this is really the contribution then of the stakeholders of the carbon intensive uh, regions to the just transition of the territories. I mean, first of all, I want to congratulate and thank the members of the working group for their work, apart from those who will be here <laughs> indeed. Indeed, a very well-deserved thank you and round of applause. In addition to those who will be presenting um, up here, we have others in the room. So thank you very much for being here, and I will certainly call on you later to also share, share your experience, so please be prepared. The working groups will continue um, in, the next, in the next month, and so we really want to, make, to encourage the members of the group to take ownership of the recommendations which you've come uh, together to make and which will be presented uh, now. So our session, we will begin with uh, a presentation uh, by the JTP Secretariat of um, the implementation plan, give some insights, and then we will have a presentation of three of the individual, individual actions. So I would like to invite up onto the podium uh, the panel uh, this morning. So first, Elodie uh, Sala, who is the, coming from the JTP uh, working group, sec uh, JTP Secretariat, sorry, on the working groups. Um, Mags Bird who is a senior policy officer at WWF, who has been uh, leading Action 3. Corinna Zirold, who's a senior policy advisor at Industrial, who's been working on a leading Action 4. 
and Monica Banker, a policy and network coordinator from the European Chemical Regions Network, Action 12. Welcome, all of you. And I'm very pleased then to give Elodie the floor for a presentation of the overall implementation plan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Catherine, for giving me the opportunity to present the implementation plan on behalf of the Just Transition Working Groups. So maybe before diving into the presentation of the implementation plan, um, I would like to maybe refresh your memories and say a couple of words about why uh, um, the, the GTP working groups have been created and what they, they do exactly. Um, so the, the main objective of the Just Transition um, platform working groups is to bring together stakeholders that have at least one thing in common, is their involvement in the Just Transition process. Um, so these uh, members are very varied and, and diverse. Um, they come from a national uh, authority, so ministries, but also local and regional uh, authorities. Civil society is also um, represented and also um, uh, other um, organizations are being uh, present and um, participating actively in the work of the, of the working groups. Um, so as Catherine was saying, we have four uh, working groups in total, three which are specifically focusing on sector, sectors uh, which are carbon intensive, so steel, cement and chemical industries, and then another fourth working group which is a bit more specific and looking at more horizontal issues um, linked to stakeholder engagement and involvement of the just transition process. Um, more specifically, uh, you can see uh, on the slide um, the aims of the working groups so first is to establish and strengthen networks of, of stakeholders. These uh, members are meeting several times per, per year, and we have organized also the working groups in different circles. So um, the first circle is the more active members, so the core membership of the, of the working groups. So um, yeah, Max, Corina, and Monica are members of the first circle working, uh, working groups. And then we have other circles who would like to also be informed uh, on, the, um, on the activities of the working groups, but don't necessarily want to have a very active involvement. So also if you are interested in knowing a bit more about the working groups, do know that the door remains uh, open. Then um, the, one of the other objectives of the working groups is to develop a common vision and to discuss about what, uh, what could be concretely um, um, presented and developed to support uh, stakeholders to implement the turtle just transition um, plan, so to develop a common vision and to be as concrete as possible. Um, also to collect and share knowledge and good practices on challenges. As I said before, the membership of the working group is quite diverse and it's very important to take into account as many uh, perspectives as possible when thinking about the implementation of the, of the plans. Finding practical solutions, again, this is not um, a talking club, let's say, where all the um, working group members really try hard to find as concrete solution as possible in terms of helping to engage better certain um, stakeholders, for instance, vulnerable groups, and there's one specific action on that or a different type of other stakeholders. And finally, um, to support the European Commission in developing inclusive approaches to the transition. Again, this is developed in the, uh, in the implementation plan. So in terms of timeline, um, so as Catherine was, was saying, the uh, four just transition working groups have been established in November 2021, following by a public call for expression for interest that was um, open, open for a couple of months. There was a selection process and uh, the uh, four working groups were officially launched and created in November 2021. There was two phases basically that they all followed. First of all, uh, it started with a scoping phase. So really trying to see what are the main priorities linked to each of their group, whether it is related to the steel sector or more about how to engage better stakeholders. So 
this uh, scoping phase lasted for about six months, and uh, the main output was scoping papers, which were um, published last year uh, exactly. So after the scoping phase, it entered into more implementation phase, what we called. So after having identified the main priority areas, the uh, working group members have um, convened again and tried to reflect, saying, okay, now that we have identified the main priorities, what can we concretely um, provide and suggest, recommend to the European Commission, but also other stakeholders uh, to help in supporting the implementation of the total launch just transition plan. So you can see we've had different meetings. Actually, the sixth one is uh, tomorrow. And um, on, uh, on Monday, the final implementation plan was, was published. So this implementation plan is really the main milestone now of the, the main outputs of the work of the, and the activities of the working groups. It aims at providing a quite detailed overview of, the, uh, of all the actions. And um, this is also available on, on the website. I think the online um, participants of the event can have a look. I will try to put the, the link of, on the, um, of the implementation plan on the, on the chat. So what does it contain? You can see um, the table of content of the, of the implementation plan. It's, as I said, a quite detailed document and is structured, as you can see on the right-hand side of the, of, the, of the slides. The action is really um, uh, detailed quite specifically, uh, starting with what is the issue to be addressed, what are the objectives of the, of the action, what are the expected outputs also of the action, how the action will be implemented, so how the, ac the working group members um, will do in the coming months in order to implement the action and which also stakeholders they will um, involve in implementing the action. What is the expected impact? This is quite important to, to really see how the, um, um, the actions can have um, an impact on the ground. Which other um, working group members are involved? As I said before, this is a common implementation plan. So that means that the uh, different working groups have been also working together and seeing how they can together and jointly um, implement the, uh, the actions, but also through other uh, circles of the working groups or other external stakeholders. What is the timeline? This is quite important also. So what are the next steps? And any other links and synergies with other um, existing initiatives and projects? This is quite important. As I said before, there are different stakeholders. They all have uh, been working on different projects. And uh, I know also of different networks and initiatives. So just to keep um, an open mind regarding this. Um, you can have, uh, you can see the link uh, there. So I'm also inviting you to have a look at the at the document. Um, and just to give you an overview, I'm not going to go <laughs> through all the actions, of course. But in total, we have 17 actions. Um, the color code is just a categorization by by inputs by output, sorry. So either toolkit, handbook, or guides. Some are recommendations and some other are a collection of, of good practices. I think it was mentioned several times in the, uh, in the conference that it was a need of knowing uh, of good practices. So this is a good tool, I think, um, that, uh, that can be used. You can see also the different, uh, the different actions were um, kind of merged. Um, so this is, um, for instance, the, the action on the engagement and social dialogue that Corina will, will explain later. Uh, which is quite important for all the, all the working groups, so not only to one specific sector. Um, there's also, just to give you two more examples uh, of the actions, one is to um, help and to provide a methodology for instance, to public authorities on how to engage vulnerable groups. So there's a specific action for that. And uh, another one which I found also quite interesting is how to assess the involvement of stakeholders. Because as you know, in the implementation, so not only in the programming, but all now in the implementation of the territorial just transition plans, it's quite important to involve all stakeholders, all relevant stakeholders. But the question uh, often is, okay, good, but how do you then assess this? 
So there's a specific action trying to as, uh, address this issue on how to uh, qualitatively assess the involvement of all stakeholders. So um, I'll finish by, by saying that this is um, the main uh, goal of this implementation plan and also the work of the, and activities of the working group members is to provide a concrete uh, possible solution and support also to the other stakeholders, so maybe uh, public authorities, but also civil society sector to uh, implement the uh, territorial and just transition plans. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elodie, for that presentation. I think I just want to pick up on, on one of your last points, which is that the, the work of the groups and the, the implementation plan is really, we want it to be useful for those implementing uh, the program. So you, of course, here in the room, those online, the, the other partners in the regions. So we, of course, it will be available online, but we really want today to give the opportunity to present a few of the actions in more detail, so you get a taste of what they are then please go and look and then we can have that dialogue. Are these useful? What else could we do? So I think it's really, we want to start today with, these, with this presentation of the plan, a dialogue with you about how this can be useful and how we can go forward. We have 17 um, actions in the plan. We're going to present three of them today. First of all, I'm going to ask Max um, to please present action three, which is uh, designing a toolkit for communicating about the just transition with citizens and municipalities. Mags, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, this is quite a cross-cutting action uh, area, communication. Everybody is able to talk about communication and have an opinion on communication as a sort of bedrock that we need to get right in the area of just transition. So in a way, I have the, the easy task in engaging you on this action as first up this morning. And I was delighted at the end of our last session when our colleague from Spain uh, mentioned communication as one of the two ingredients that we need to get right in order to overcome potential resistance to just transition and to get all the right stakeholders on board. So that was a very useful springboard uh, for this action area this morning. Thank you. Um, you can see on the screen the objectives that we're trying to achieve, so the sort of focus with this action. And the title says design a toolkit. We're not quite sure what that looks like yet. But the focus is about uh, getting something practical out there that helps with this issue of communication, particularly at the local level. If we just take a step back into the scoping process that Elodie mentioned this morning that's um, been the, the basis for the design of these actions, the scoping process around this action area really uh, threw up the issue of the wealth of misinformation or disinformation, which is possible and frequent around just transition, and how this can be a threat uh, to both transparency and to engagement and getting the right people on board and getting all the different stakeholders on board. And we've seen uh, from uh, this conference and from the, all the work preceding it, the wide range of stakeholders that we need to be able to, to bring together in the Just Transition process. So it's quite important that we have very clear and targeted information going out about the Just Transition processes and how to get involved, especially at the local level. And the other thing the scoping process threw up was the importance of this for involving smaller actors um, and not just having the usual suspects in the room, the people, the companies, the organizations, the agencies that are maybe well connected, uh, well resourced. Um, we need to be having the conversation more widely and enabling the participation of other groups, citizens, um, other parts of civil society, smaller business. Um, so the issue of communicating clearly sort of again underpins all of that. And it's easy to, under, to assume sitting here that everybody has a shared picture of just transition and we all know what we're talking about. Here we have a bunch of people who've been working on this for, for many, many years as we heard this morning. But we know that actually out there getting it done on the ground it's still, in some ways, some pioneering work. There are still new audiences um, to reach. So our objectives are there. 
in terms of the progress so far on how we tackle this action area, thank you to all of you who filled out a survey earlier this year. We put a beautiful Europeanly multilinguistic survey out there. We had a good response and importantly from a range of contexts. So we had re replies from people across 15 different countries and across all our stakeholder groups. I'm not going to give you a detailed presentation on what we found out. We're still doing the, the nitty gritty analysis of the results, but we will be sharing the, the findings more widely in the working group. In terms of a teaser though, what we can already see is that the people that chose to respond to the survey, there is a shared vision. So we asked about definition. There is a shared vision of what just transition is about. So that's already a good basis to build the communications on. However, even though the people that responded to the survey are you guys and people that like got the link through a just transition newsletter, so in a way a self-selecting audience, the survey was very clear that actually a lot of people said it's actually quite difficult to get involved in just transition processes. So the rating of how easy was it for you to get involved in your just transition was actually a little bit low. And obviously then communication came out as one of the keys to that. People were also saying very much that communication and information in different areas is a key barrier to getting involved in just transition projects. So yes, there are barriers like administrative complications, but things like matching funds and stuff like that weren't really coming up there on the radar. It was the information blockages that were, were some of the key things. And we also found out some useful things from the survey about indicators of preferred channels of communication, which again will be useful then in, in formatting up where we go next with this. And that wasn't always as expected. We assume that we're all just Googling things and pulling information off the net, but there's a big demand out there for more targeted information via newsletters, targeted emails, and a surprising appetite for communication in person. And I think, again, on the local level, that's going to come up as something that's quite key. So talking increasingly rapidly, so I don't go over my time, the next steps in our action group. We're going to complete our analysis of the survey results. It's not just a bunch of data. We also got some quite useful free form type comments and inputs. And these will inform the design of the communication tools that we're looking at. And again, we'll be sharing those findings with other action groups because it's obviously relevant not just to communication products, but to, you saw the different actions up there on the screen very briefly. There's a lot of actions in the working groups around stakeholder involvement, identification of different groups, um, how you interact with, with different people, um, all of those things. This communications information is very relevant too. Our key first resource that we're looking at is a sort of a short guide, we're calling it, on what Just Transition is uh, for municipalities and citizens groups especially. There are many explanations and there are some quite good things out there, but something that's very targeted at seeing the whole picture from top to bottom and explaining it in a clear and joined up way seems to be a gap um, that, that could be filled. We will continue through the year to have further exchange on just transition awareness and communication. And please chip in. Uh, everybody can talk about it from your experience. Please do feel free to feed in your views, even if you missed the survey. We're really interested to hear how it looks in the different contexts and what your good and bad experiences have been, key recommendations, things you think need reinforcing. Um, on our action plan, it says develop a handbook or a toolkit. We're not quite sure what that looks like. It will be a compilation. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. As I say, there's a lot of stuff out there about communication, but we're trying to make it more accessible and adaptable uh, so that we can talk about just transition more coherently and target that communication uh, down to places where it might not be reaching as effectively at the moment. So uh, again, ideas and contributions, very welcome. Um, and I will finish there. And there are other members of our action group here in the room. So also uh, if they want to comment or add, 
um, or you want to talk to them, then they will make themselves known. They're the ones smiling at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Meg. Thank you. So, Max, thank you. You were, you were explaining um, the challenges that there are in, in communication. And indeed, we're sitting here uh, together and with those online, and we are self-selecting in the sense that we're here. And so we know a little bit about a just transition. So I think the preliminary results that you've had from your survey are really extremely interesting, a little bit concerning, but not surprising at, at the same time. Um, I mean, obviously, it's a work in progress, but do you, can you give us any ideas of what you would consider as, as an efficient way of reaching out to stakeholders? You talked about the survey, which, you've already, which, you've, which you have already carried out. So either at this broader level or at the local, regional level, or any other things that you've already thought about that could be useful? Yeah, I mean, especially with our first... Um if you like, product that we're looking at, which won't be super sophisticated, but which we build as a short guide. We're looking at trying to find something that joins the dots because everybody has one part of the picture. And I mean, I think it's been reflected in the discussions here this morning. You know, either people are afraid of the change that's happening as their traditional industry withers away, or they're frightened for their job, or they're frightened for their town, or... Uh, but everybody, when actually you sit and talk about it, everybody understands the global challenge that we have in terms of climate change and decarbonisation. And everybody you know, can see it from a citizen's perspective, a householder's perspective. And actually what we need is to be able just to put a very basic clear chain of information together uh, you know, the challenge, the mechanism that we're talking about, and then where to get involved and find uh, further information in order to then frame that discussion. So that would already make communication and those discussions and those um, uh, challenges of stakeholder involvement, that would already facilitate it if we had a more common, clear uh, page to start with. Um, and then, of course, it needs to be very tailored. And one thing that we're hearing very much is people need to know where to go next on a very local level. So who's actually responsible in their local context that they can turn to for more information? And that needs to be as personable as possible. People like to talk to people. They don't like to just go to a website. And then, of course, a million more ideas, as you can feel. And the discussions this morning make us think, OK, maybe we need to think about, is there a targeted approach if we're trying to involve youth more? Is there some people here who might like to contribute thoughts on communicating with that as an up-and-coming stakeholder group? So. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. It's a good link on to um, our next presentation by, by Corinna. So, Corinna, you're going to uh, talk us through the action on establishing a series of recommendations for effective social dialogue. Um, the floor's over to you, please. Thank you. Um, actually, I wanted to start with a comment on what was said uh, in the previous panel on um, the resistance, overcoming the resistance to just transition. Um, if we really, um, well, if we feel there is resistance, are we on the right track? I mean, can we talk about just transition if there's resistance? Because obviously then there's people that do not feel included. So um, uh, this is a point I would like to make because this is also important um, to, um, in terms of um, the recommendations on effective social dialogue that I will make. Um, and there, um, as trade unions, um, uh, we've been um, We've been actually calling for social dialogue in terms of just transition um, since a long time. Uh, we've been involved in establishing the um, recommendations, the guidelines um, within the International Labour Organization on uh, just transition and social dialogue, um, be it uh, tripartite between authorities, between um, labour trade unions and employers, um, but also bipartite between, just simply between um, trade unions and employers is crucial. And this is really, um, I think I, I just recommend you to, to go through the guidelines because they've been established just after the Paris Agreement or with the Paris Agreement um, in 2015. And we still see we're, we're quite lacking behind in implementing um, social dialogue on the ground. And therefore, we, um, together with the inter um, European Trade Union Confederation, we've been actually leading um, this recommendation on establishing um, 
uh, effective social dialogue or recommendations to all the stakeholders to, to engage in a social dialogue, um, to um, actually make it happen on the ground, uh, involve workers, because in the end, um, we, we've been discussing yesterday about the shortage of, of workers in some regions, um, about um, uh, the perceived lack of attractiveness of, of moving to some regions, of um, picking up a job in, in, in some industries. Um, and uh, so social dialogue is really a key issue there. Involve the trade unions because they defend the workers that will be crucial in driving the energy transition. So um, in that terms, um, our objective is actually to develop those guidelines um, with uh, principles that will guide the effective implementation of social dialogue on the ground. So um, let me be clear, on European level, we have social dialogue, um, industry all, uh, the European trade union confederations. We are involved um, at the European level. Um, we are discussing um, the transition with uh, our social partners, with employer organizations, um, in extractive industries, in steel, uh, cement, um, uh, and, and, and chemicals. So we have, we have a dialogue uh, taking place, but um, the problem is actually what is happening in the on the ground. And unfortunately, despite that there is actually also um, legislation and uh, social dialogue is actually also a part of the European treaty, we do not see it happening everywhere. And therefore, um, I mean, again, the recommendations. Um, so in terms of progress uh, that we've been doing so far, um, together with the tra uh, European Trade Union Confederation, we've been uh, leading a survey um, of our affiliated trade unions um, where we uh, try to understand um, and how far um, our unions were involved in the process of um, designing uh, territorial just transition plans. Um, unfortunately, what, what we found out is that only um, half of the unions that uh, responded to the survey were somehow uh, involved in the preparation of the um, TGTPs. And um, unfortunately, many of those uh, still perceive this um, involvement as too limited, um, not comprehensive enough, um, because you can consult in different ways. No? You can have a written consultation and look at the answers, but you can also have a real profound dialogue um, and try to overcome also barriers, resistances um, with, the, with those groups um, and with unions. So, um, and what was surprising is that um, actually uh, some of those unions that, uh, that were quite critical about the involvement were also unions and even in countries where you have well-established industrial relations systems. So, um, yeah, that is one, uh, one um, uh, finding that we had. Um, and at the same time, um, we, we have, um, as I said, European sectoral social dialogue committees. We have committees where we are discussing um, the issue um, with the employers on European level. So we've been also moni monitoring what is going on in terms of territorial just transition plans in the social dialogues for steel, chemicals and extractive industries. They are also reflecting um, somehow the, the work that we have in the just transition platform working groups. Um, and what we've been also doing as Industry All Europe together with uh, EDUC is uh, that we ha uh, offered uh, very much bilateral support of our trade unions um, where we felt um, or that actually flagged up to us that um, uh, the engagement, their engagement in the process wasn't, um, wasn't well enough or was not working well. Uh, or they were not, their opinion were not, was not really um, taken into account. So, this about the process so far, and now about the sec uh, next steps. Um, uh, obviously, I, I talked a lot about, we want to define recommendations um, from a European level, but I think what has to happen is also that there is a clear understanding how to implement social dialogue on the, on the ground and on the national and local level. So um, I think unions have to be involved also, not only at the European level, I said it's working 
quite good already here at the European level, but we really have to um, uh, get the um, unions and uh, employers on the ground um, involved. So in that sense, it's not only um, the, 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 the top-down approach that we are developing some uh, recommendations, but there needs to be also an agreement on the national local level of unions and employers on how to best approach it and how to also really um, um, make it happen and also implement parts of the um, legislative text that we have actually at the EU level in terms of social dialogue. Um, uh, we, uh, um, we have met with representatives of the European Commission and um, we are um, uh, going to have further meetings, I'm pretty sure. But what is important is um, in, in, the, in the context of these recommendations on uh, social dialogue is that we also have to connect the dots of the various um, activities and um, transition discussions we have within the European Commission. Um, uh, we have uh, not only the uh, work in the Just Transition Platform Working Groups, but we have also the process with DGGO where we um, define transition pathways in different uh, sectors. And unfortunately, um, we do not perceive that this is a really coherent uh, process yet, and not all the actors are involved in all um, these uh, processes. We also have social dialogue. Again, um, those uh, committees have been discussing the transition already since a decade. Um, and um, sometimes we are discussing that in our corners, but we, are, we really now want to see that we connect the dots. Um, somehow, um, and this is in the first point, we also would like to li see, see a link to the creation of Just Transition Observatories. It's another action point um, that we, are, we have been also co-created, uh, point five in the implementation plan. And this will be also crucial in terms of um, the implementation, monitoring and assessments of TGTPs. And finally, as a final next step, um, we, we want to see then, um, of course, those recommendations being uh, taken, um, social dialogue really uh, being promoted, and actors being being involved, social uh, social partners being involved in the in the implementation phase of the TGTPs. And here I stop my introduction. Thank you very much. Corinna, one of the main the main points that you were underlining was the the situation at the local level as opposed to the situation at, at the European level. And I think we've all taken that message very clearly. Can you, do you, can you identify for us why that's so difficult? What are the challenges of, of setting up that social dialogue at, at the local level? Well, I think it's it's a difference in implementation of, of legislation. Um, we, as industry all year, we have um, had um, a wide process of um, discussion on just transition with our members from different regions. And it's clear that social dialogue and industrial relations take, pla take place on very various levels um, in the different member states. And in some um, social dialogue is not happening in all, at all. Sometimes it's a lack of, of really uh, support and will um, uh, by governments, unfortunately. And sometimes it's also a lack of um, uh, having the counterpart in terms of employment, employer organizations. Um, if we talk about a social dialogue, we also talk about collective bargaining. And we do talk about wages because, um, of course, what we want to see in the transition um, from, from um, the fossil industry is that we, we have also um, good wages and good working conditions in, in the new emerging sectors and new industries uh, being built. And that, therefore, um, yeah, we have to really um, look into the implementation of the uh, key uh, legislative text that is there. A major step now is that um, we have the minimum wage um, uh, directive um, with, um, uh, with a provision that there must be an action plan um, for collective to achieve a certain collective bargaining coverage in member states. So for countries where um, there's um, less than 80% of uh, coverage of uh, collective agreements, we need um, those countries countries have to come up with an action plan, which is really decisive and we, we really, uh, as trade unions, understand that um, only through collective bargaining and, and um, en engaging 
um, uh, trade unions and, and employers in this process, can you also achieve a just transition? And so this, just as an example, mm -hmm. we need really to work on the implementation um, of, of these texts and to, to, to raise the level of, of um, uh, dialogue uh, with the actors that are really involved and driving the transition. Thank you. I mean, I, we saw that the, the figure you put up that there was not the involvement of the social partners in, in the negotiation, the discussion, development of many of the TJTPs. So I think, but now we have an opportunity in the implementation phase, nonetheless, to put things on, on the right track. Thank you very much again. Um, I'm going to turn to Monica now. We're, we're focusing now on, on one of the sectoral specific um, uh, actions. So this is about compiling a compendium of best practices on energy transition governance in cross-border interregional cooperation. Monica, thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. At the beginning, I would really like to say a big thank to the JTP Secretariat and DG Regio for all the help you provided us to prepare these actions, to identify the challenges, and uh, to organizing this uh, conference. And uh, I represent the European Chemical Regions Network, and we already have uh, around 20 years of experience. And we represent the regions where the chemical industry <coughs> plays a crucial role in their economy, employment, and growth. And uh, probably if you think that you are not the chemical region, I can assure you that you are, because basically everything what surrounds us uh, that are chemicals, and we are using them for the daily basis. And uh, among the objectives of our network is to represent uh, the regions and to bring the regional perspective to the attention of the EU institutions. That's why we decided to join the working group on chemicals under the Just Transition platform and to highlight the role of local and regional authorities in the whole process of the Just Transition. Because when we look at the Just Transition, uh, we cannot think only about uh, the industry. We need to have this bigger perspective because we, when we discuss about uh, the employment or the uh, environmental aspect, that are the things that uh, affect not only the particular city, not only the particular region, but they also affect the neighborhood areas. So that's why this uh, cross-border interregional cooperation is so essential if we really want to think about moving forward with the just transition and also to communicate the just transition and to properly involve social partners and other relevant stakeholders. So the challenges related to, um, to the just transition are much wilder than one particular single region. And uh, what is also very important, why this uh, regional perspective is so important, is the fact that regions, they know the best what is happening on the ground. They understand the best the problems and ch challenges related to the market, to the transition to the industry and to others that are involved in this whole process, even if they are not aware that they are involved. That is happening man in many cases. So, uh, because the regional administration really dealing with the consequences of the transition, we wanted to strongly highlight the role in this working group and also highlight the role of interregional and cross-border cooperation. Uh, so, um, one maybe additional thing, because um, we had this three uh, working groups on steel, cement, and chemicals. And I would say that in this case, the chemical sector is like, as I said, it touches every aspect of our daily life. And what is also very important and what is different between the sector and others, that it's the majority of this industry are small and medium-sized enterprises. So it means they are very, uh, fragile uh, to the changes on the market. And we observe it re uh, recently very well, the changes uh, uh, and disruptions uh, with the supply chains caused by the pandemic or by the war in Ukraine. So we need to put a special attention on the sector. And uh, coming back to this uh, Action 12 uh, identified under the working group. So first of all, we want to prepare this compendium of the good practices on energy transition governance in cross-border interregional 
cooperation. And today and yesterday I heard so many really magnificent examples of what you do and you can be proud of what you do. So we really would like to collect these examples to speed up the transition because in many cases there's no need to invent the wheel from the scratch. Some solutions that are already there and they can be simply, simply replicated that can uh, help us to limit time, cost, and uh, administrative capacity that is needed uh, to implement some solutions. So uh, we think that it's very important to share this uh, experience you have, and it was also mentioned yesterday by the Commissioner Ferreira, that that's a key element, basically, if we want to think about uh, speed up with the transition. Uh, and I can imagine that probably uh, some of you can think, oh, we are already so busy. We have so much to do and you already expect from us that we will prepare something uh, to share with others. But uh, I think we need to look at this uh, as a, to have the bigger perspective that we are doing this not just to, okay, I did it and uh, you can use this experience. No, it can help us to really move forward and to speed up the whole process. If you, for example, have these best practices in your region, it might be much easier for others simply to replicate your, uh, your ideas, your solutions, your approaches. That's why... Um, Maybe before I move to the next steps, I also want to say that we already had the meetings uh, with a couple of European regions uh, and discussed if they are really uh, committed to the sharing best practices and uh, if they are ready to do this and spend their time and efforts to prepare this uh, uh, compendium of the best practices. And so far, we have really nice feedback. However, I understand that that's a long-term process and it's not so easy to prepare a comprehensive information about uh, uh, the projects that are managed by you. In many cases, there are some confidential information related to the technology, solutions, and they cannot be shared. However, I would say uh, I'm pretty sure that still there, there's a lot of uh, very good examples of the governance of cross-border and interregional projects. And uh, one, of the, one of the next steps is, of course, the preparation of the online survey. And uh, we want to prepare the survey in the coming uh, weeks, so you can expect uh, it in, um, I would say, maybe before a summer break, hopefully. And uh, at this point, I really would like to encourage you to feel the survey when you receive it. Uh, as I said, I know that regional local uh, authorities are super busy and the workload you have, it's really uh, incredible. But uh, without your engagement, without your examples, and we heard this today and yesterday, uh, we cannot really speed up the process. So uh, at this point, I really would like to uh, encourage you and convince to contribute to the discussion. And on basis of this survey, we uh, want to prepare first the draft and then the full version of the comprehensive uh, compendium of the good practices that can help to manage the transition in, uh, let's say, more, more vulnerable regions that are not the front runners, that are not so advanced with the transition. So uh, I, want, I want to use this opportunity to, uh, to really invite you to be part of this process and to help us to properly frame this document. Because, uh, for example, the slides from today's presentation, they may disappear somewhere on many websites. And uh, it is sometimes difficult to find the proper information and they are spread all over the different websites. And that's why we want to have such information in one place, easy, accessible, easy to find. Uh, hopefully we can prepare it in 
few EU languages because that is also something we identified that uh, the access to the information uh, is mostly available in English and that's also the barrier uh, when it comes to the implementation of the solutions and uh, when uh, someone wants to use some examples. So that's also an idea to translate uh, this um, compendium e at least in the couple of European most popular languages to help you to use it. So that's all from my side right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Monica. You've, uh, you've made a very clear plea there for contribution. Um, and I think that's probably something which will be echoed by the other, by the other groups and by the other um, parts of the action plan. I have just one specific question for you before I invite questions from, from the audience. It's, we're talking about the chemical sector. You're coming from the chemical sector. So I, I wondered if you could identify any specificities of the chemical sector and the transition? Uh, yes, that's, this sector is uh, very specific because, um, of course, we have this uh, big international companies that operate worldwide, but uh, according to the statistics, 96% uh, of companies uh, in chemical sector are small and medium-sized enterprises. It means that they are really sensitive on the changes on the market, in many cases, then they depend on one supplier or one ingredient that they use for the production. So the disruptions with the value chains we observed recently are super uh, dangerous for them and can really affect the sector. So uh, the transition uh, requires also um, our work to reach these companies because in many cases, especially with small and medium-sized uh, enterprises, they do not have enough administrative capacity capacity to prepare, for example, the call applications or to uh, have people who are responsible for the uh, just transition. It's not like in the uh, big companies they can uh, have the whole departments responsible for that. Uh, in this case, uh, they are focused on their job, their research, their production, and in many cases they do not have efforts, uh, financial or human resources, uh, to tackle the energy transition. So in this case, uh, this help from from a local regional authorities is absolutely essential to help them to properly tackle the energy transition. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I wanted to also pick up another point you made, which is to recall on, on languages. You talked about the importance of languages. I wanted to remind you that you can also ask a question in something other than, than English, as well as listening in the languages that we have available. So don't, don't hesitate. We already have a question here. Please, and if it's to somebody in spe specifically, please, please let us know who. Uh, hi, my name is Miuka Stempien, I'm from Bankwatch, um, and I have a question for Monika Banka. Uh, so, um, the chemical sector, I mean, um, if you look at uh, what happened in Central and Eastern Europe during the transformation period in the 1990s, where you had a lot of companies, including chemical companies, closing down, um, what happened in a lot of cases was, was that um, there was no follow-through in terms of taking care of um, the re remnants, uh, sometimes very um, negative to the environment of various chemical industries. Do you think that currently, as we're preparing, or, or as we're going through the transition at the moment, that the European Union and the countries are prepared to face the necessity of handling uh, chemical waste? Uh, as we transition away from the chemical, uh, or transition within the chemical industries? I know it's a difficult question, so I'm sorry. Yes, indeed, it's a very difficult question. Uh, I would say that there's a lot of approaches uh, to do this, and it depends on the country and the region. However, uh, several actions are uh, done on the European level to support uh, the problems with uh, waste and in general the, the problem with the, uh, with the transition. And uh, of course one of them is just transition platform, but uh, there are also projects uh, financed by Horizon. Uh, they can help to tackle the, the problem of the waste from the chemical sector. So, um, of course, it's hard to say, to, to give you like right now the, the, the proper examples, but uh, I would say we already have this experience from the previous years, so it would be quite uh, strange if we couldn't manage it in the proper way and to have this uh, uh, right now, this uh, 
um, approach that takes into account all the aspects of uh, like the human uh, health, environmental aspect, and so on. So um, the project I, for example, I know right now is founded by uh, Horizon Europe. Uh, it's related to the plastic flows, uh, municipal plastic flows, but uh, I'm pretty sure there's much more on that. Uh, if uh, you want to know more, we can talk later. Maybe we can also prepare something uh, directly, uh, like collecting the information that might be useful for you to, to give the proper answer for, to that. Thank you very much, Monica. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to invite, obviously, any questions that you had that were inspired by, by the presentations, questions or contributions, thoughts that were generated by uh, the presentations we heard. As I warned, I also wanted to invite those members of the working groups who are here. Please, we couldn't invite you all, but we, we really would have liked to hear also more, um, more experience and more contributions. So please, please identify yourselves and please share perhaps from a different action uh, so we hear a bit more broadly about what the implementation plan includes. That would be very interesting, I think, for everybody. I'm also looking uh, to the colleagues to see if anything is coming in online, so please don't hesitate to, to write your questions also there and we can feed those in if you have them. Gentleman over here, thank you. Hi, I'm Michiel Stapper, uh, Assistant Professor from Tilburg University. Thank you for the presentations and your interesting work. Um, and I have a question because uh, there are, of course, many European funds that uh, try to stimulate the economy and regional development, but we only have one just transition fund. So I want to hear from you. Um, how can the implementation of the territory just transition plan really achieve justice? And how can we uh, prevent that only the usual suspects really benefit from the European funding? So these organizations, these SMEs that really know already how to apply for European funding and how, reach, how to reach this really difficult to reach groups. And there has been a lot of discussion about young people, but what about women? What about migrants? And well, we add it, what about young female migrants? And so how to reach this really difficult to reach groups and how we, um, also let them benefit from the Just Transition Fund. Thank you very much, Michiel. So uh, how can we really ach achieve the Just Transition? With the Just Transition Fund, I was happy that you mentioned the other funds that we have because the Just Transition Fund is extremely focused and it's a key part of delivering on the European Green Deal. It builds on the other funds under cohesion policy, which of course are going in, in tandem and complementing the work through the Just Transition Fund. But your point also on how do we reach new groups, how these, the, the other, the un, unrepresented, unreached uh, uh, groups of society, which is of course essential. I'm looking for someone to be jumping up. I don't know, Mag's on the communication, maybe you have something, thank you. I mean, obviously the key is communication. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think a lot of very relevant comments have already been made in, in, in previous um, panels and discussions. Um, yes, Just Transition Fund, there's a lot of attention on it, and rightly so. It's a sort of flagship project, and we need it to succeed. Um, often people say to me, well, why is WWF interested in Just Transition? Why is an environmental organization uh, sitting on a panel with trade unions and the chemical sector and people from, you know, what, where, how does it fit in the universe? But actually, we have this problem, which is climate change. And it's not just an environmental problem. It's a people problem. It's a, from the people, and it affects the people. And actually, if we don't get the social side of it right, and the governance side and the funding side, then we're all stuffed, if I'm allowed to <laughs> say it that bluntly. And of course, there are environmental aspects, but it's about joining the dots. And here I see a whole load of social actors, social organizations who are fighting for the planet. And so from my environmental organization, I come into a very receptive uh, field, but I also take away the people aspect that then go into the in environmental um, chain of policy and things. And that's, that's super important. And that's very linked to what this Just Transition is all about. And as uh, the gentleman asking the question um, rightly said, it, it, we need to be touching all sorts of people and non-traditional groups and people that we might not normally think of. And yes, of course, it's about communication, but it's also about how we put our principles into action. 
and the model that we want to make of it. And people this morning have talked about having a portfolio of projects rather than just a pipeline of projects. And we know that funds are limited and there will be never enough funds to do everything on the list. So in a way, it's also from where I sit, it's about um, having a portfolio of projects that achieves a meaningful change. It's not meant to be decorative. We're meant to get the job done. Let's be clear about that and get it done quite urgently. But we're also trying to show what it looks like to build a society-wide future. And there's a lot of attention on just transition and a lot of interest, and we're going to be hearing international perspectives and how it looks around the world, I think, later on. Um, so in a way, there's a responsibility that comes with that. We've got to use this to model what we want more of in the future. And so even when the funds don't stretch to everybody, we do have to pick certain groups that might not be traditional stakeholders because we're trying to build a, a model of actually what we want our society to look like as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Corinna Monik, anything? I would add to that uh, the education. Uh, if we want to think about the transition, we need to start from the very beginning uh, and to start with the education of uh, young people and also try to educate people about uh, the, um, the industry. So we need to think uh, how to change the image of the industry that it's not always dangerous to our health, that they don't want to always to destroy the environment. Uh, and they are doing also a lot to protect uh, well-being and environment. So we, we are trying to do very much, um, we are trying to do really a lot on education. That's why we also uh, establish a partnership for skills uh, in the chemical sector. So also the um, well-prepared uh, labor force that really understand the market, that they really understand the industry. It's also something very important to reach people and to convince them to the just transition. Karina, thank you. Yeah, um, just in addition to what has been already uh, said and with what I also agree, communication is certainly key. I think we also have to think about um, capacity building of, of certain um, organizations, associations that do not have um, the understanding or the knowledge of how to, how to access funds. I think this, is, this has been also flagged up by our um, trade union organizations that not always um, had the necessary information. And um, so I think this is cru crucial and key to also um, involve other um, groups um, that might not be uh, feel um, uh, well represented. But uh, yeah, I think uh, it's also building coalitions, but um, capacity building is also crucial in uh, really um, offering support to those um, uh, actors that have not the um, uh, institutional strength to actually also get a chance um, in, in tapping uh, resources in, in doing work on the ground and um, uh, making sure the transition is really just. A very quick response and then, and then the other gentleman, thank you. Yeah, thanks, I, I will be short and of course, I know it's very difficult, but m maybe we can flip your arguments around and uh, it shouldn't be these groups that need to be educated or raise awareness, that maybe the people in this room, all of us, need to be more aware and have better communication skills to reach these groups. And it should be go both ways and not only from these people to those groups, but also the other way around. Thanks. Thank you. I think we probably all, all agree with that. And I think part of the communication, and as you were saying this, is it's not just kind of sending things in one direction, but expecting to get things back and recognizing our own role and our responsibilities in this. Please. Oh, good morning. My name is Michael Stanley, and I run the Global Just Transition Program for the World Bank based in uh, Singapore. Um, I think that in terms of implementation, I think there are two things. I think that certainly communication is key. Our global experience is that coordination is also key. And this has proven to be, and I just heard, I think it was Mags mentioned, but you know, capacity at the local level. Coordination has proven to keep a lot of these programs from going to full implementation. And so increasingly, we're looking at special purpose entities, which are uh, authorized enterprises that can bring together different ministries, different stakeholders, 
and have a very dedicated and, and key contribution in the just transition space. And so I think that's, I think that that's something that here in Europe and elsewhere is really proving to be quite a challenge and something that I think we should all think about a little bit more. With apologies, I'll miss the international session this afternoon, so I wanted to put that out there, there now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. I don't know if, I mean, of course, coordination, absolutely. I mean, we've, we've seen how many stakeholders there, there are uh, engaged in this, and we want to bring in new stakeholders and, and make sure that we're hearing and taking account of all of the, the relevant voices and, and concerns. The experience of the World Bank, so you talk about special purpose entities. I don't know if any of you have heard of these, work with them, any reflections on whether they could be valuable? If not, we, we learn and we, uh, we, I hadn't heard of them before, I, I admit, so thank you, <laughs> thank you for sharing. Thank you, please. Uh, hello, Anata Green Dealers uh, Foundation. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, what is your reflection around uh, how we cannot actually only communicate in a vertical way, so uh, from, uh, authorities, experts, uh, key stakeholders to the society and even be open to, to hear them back. But how actually we are thinking in terms of supporting narratives, uh, so this communication which goes between people, narratives which will be uh, full of hope, full of empowerment, and helping them to, to embrace this transition even uh, when uh, the grants are, are not there, because th this is probably the key. We know that grants are limited uh, in, in time, grants are limited in, in the amount. Uh, so how we are thinking around, uh, around this and how we are actually empowering, uh, empowering people, how we are supporting the, uh, these interactions between them, which would be uh, more around, for example, new visions um, because this is something what is also very noticeable, I think, on the groundwork, that when we are trying to, to talk to people on the just transition, they are actually not having any kind of picture. Uh, they might be having, if, if they agree at certain point, they might be having a clear picture of the vision, how they would like to be developed uh, in the future, how they might be having their new... Uh, new idea, uh, what kind of new identity might be emerging, uh, whether they would like to develop uh, around tourism, around, uh, again, some uh, manufacturing, they would like to uh, have uh, more SMEs activities. Uh, so uh, some clear pictures are, uh, are always useful and how we are actually encouraging to, uh, to have this empowering narratives that this change uh, is, is possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you're talking about the empowering uh, the interactions, empowering the interactions of, of the different narratives. It's about communication. So Mags, I'm guessing that you probably have some views on this. I always have views on things. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's a key point that came out of the survey is that people uh, want information, but not just in a passive way, a bit like, as you were mentioning, not just top down. So, of course, people are happy to go and look things up on a website, but it's not a substitute for having a real conversation. And I think we've all experienced it. Our world has shifted since we spent a long time in lockdown and started working from home and doing everything online. And our working patterns haven't necessarily shifted back to fully live in, in the way that they, they were in a, in a previous era. And I think we need to um, understand the power of live discussion. And I mean, we've seen it here today, the, the variety of people I've met because I sat next to them or at the coffee machine, uh, whatever. It's not the same as sitting on Zoom and interacting with people who you already know because you can see their speaking points or you know where they come from. So we need to find this cross-fertilization to develop these new visions that you're talking about and enable the creativity to come in the bottom-up approach that we've also been talking about. But it is challenging because you have to invest in it. It takes time, it takes effort. And frankly, it's really scary because you might not get the replies that you want. It's a lot easier to do your consultation or your communication by sending out a survey safely from behind your desk and then analyzing the results yourself rather than getting a bunch of very diverse stakeholders um, to, together. But frankly, if we're going to make progress on this, we actually need to go out and seek out the people that we're probably not going to agree with 
and have a talk with them um, and, and build it up from the bottom. And that's the only way that we don't just generate, if you like, real collective knowledge, but that builds the trust and the transparency that we need. And we need that. We need not just the hope and the empowerment, we need the trust. So we need to talk about why it's difficult, where the barriers are, what went wrong last time we tried it, as well as collect our good practices to encourage each other along the way. So uh, yeah, it's difficult, but there you go. We're people and people are difficult, <laughs> but fun. Thank you, <laughs> indeed. It, you've reflected on something. You reflected something that uh, that Corinna said in, in her in her first intervention about the resistance. So you said we need to talk to people that don't agree with us, and that's what you said, Corinna. You said if if we have this resistance, are we doing the right thing? It's not for me to. I would say prop doesn't mean we are. We're not doing the right thing, but we need to know why there's the resistance. So that's it's indeed what how having that interaction and having those narratives. Please. Yeah, I think in that sense it's also important that we understand that, I mean, any of our as stakeholders have also different ideas of, or objectives of the transition process. We are all defending different goals. No? Like uh, we as trade unions, obviously we, wa we want to see quality jobs in the end um, of the process. We want to we want to maintain quality jobs uh, for the workers that we represent. Um, but then there's other stakeholders that have a very specific goal in this, in this transition process. And I think understanding um, the roles, the different roles of stakeholders and the st different stakes is very important to actually also um, yeah, understand and understanding where resistance comes from and then uh, actually trying to overcome um, this resistance and that we under perceive uh, coming from different sides. Monica, the, nar the narratives, the exchanges in the chemical sector. Uh, well, no, no, I would uh, totally agree with what was said. Uh, however, um, I can only add that uh, it's very important that uh, people uh, are heard. So they are not afraid to say uh, what is the problem, what they are struggling with. Uh, that their voice uh, is important, that they can trust that it will be taken into account. So it's not uh, that, for example, we have some kind of working groups or uh, other platforms for com communication, cooperation, uh, and they can join them and just listen and uh, uh, agree with uh, what is said. So it is also very important to give them space to present their uh, goals and objectives and that ensure that at least somehow they will be taken into account. So that might convince uh, people and uh, uh, limit the resistance uh, uh, for the transition. So that I would say might be important also. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I would like just to add something about the communication topic. Uh, I'm not sure if it's always resistance and if it is, this is the right word for how uh, some groups of uh, stakeholders or other people are reacting. Um, we have made the experience that, is, that it is really hard to reach SMEs, for example, in the region. Um, that means that it's already hard to take the first step to get in contact with those SMEs, probably some of them, they are in their daily business, they have to face several challenges in their wor daily work and it's not resistance I would say, it's just to have a different view and live in a different world maybe sometimes. That's what I just wanted to add and I would like also focus on the policy makers because I mean there are also views that they represent and that sometimes are um, in, contract, uh, in contra uh, contradiction to the view of the just transition. So that uh, should also be uh, kept in mind. And I would also like to uh, have a, a second point uh, concerning the big companies. Um, in our region we have the situation that we have a lot of big companies but there is only a side of a big company in our region and uh, they are not eligible with the funds of the Just Transition Fund. Also the existence of those sites uh, is in danger because of the Just Transition, 
because if there isn't any development into green fields on the site, they will be closed sooner or later. So that uh, I would also like to emphasize because this is uh, in some regions quite a problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. Thank you for those uh, thoughts and observations. Thank you very much. And then I'm, I don't know if you're a, one of, a member of the working group, but if not, I want to encourage members of the working group also to please uh, speak up and, and share afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, hi, Ivan Sergei of Estonia. I am a member of the working group, but I'm not going to be like promoting our work right now. <laughs> we'll do that tomorrow and then speak about it. But what I wanted, uh, just a quick reflection on, I guess, the self-awareness of us here, as in like communication, is a, it's just a reflection, so it's not like a question or anything, but I think it's important for us to understand who we are. For example, the managing authority. If I go and talk to people, a lot of times they won't speak to me because I'm a managing authority. I have an agenda. I have to, I have to you know, accomplish this green transition that they don't want to hear about. And so it's, it's like this, how do they perceive me? So how should I modify my own messaging in order to reach them? Like we can't just go and preach at people. So in that sense, I think the self-awareness or, or for example, managing authority like this, I'm sure with trade unions a lot of times, it's like, let's not talk to them, they're scary. They don't want this transition, they don't want to lose their jobs, they don't want actually to talk to us. They want, they're interested in keeping everything as it is. So they just don't, so it's easy to make the choice of just not even going. So in that sense, I think it's very important for us as the agents in this process to be aware of how we're being perceived and how do we interact with others and how that influences the whole process. Without that, it's useless. We'll just be talking to walls which we are in ourselves and that's it. Um, so yeah, just a, my two cents in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, but I think it's a very important point. How how are we perceived? Um, you know, to hear that as a managing authority, people don't want to talk to you. Uh, your reflection was on the trade unions. Back to the point on why were the unions not involved in the development of many of the TJTPs? Perhaps there were, was a resistance of fear of what that dialogue would would bring. And I think, as we've been saying, of course, it's easy to stand here and say it, but I think it, we do need to. To, to reach out, you know, to try at least the responsibility we have to reach out to the, all, of the, all of the stakeholders, all of the players, even when it's a difficult conversation. And as you say, to be aware of the kind of impression people have uh, when we walk into the room and what, we'll, what they think we're going to say, perhaps surprise them and say something entirely different. Emma. Hello, my name is Emma Kraus. I work for Guidehouse and we're working on uh, the JP, uh, JTP groundwork services that are uh, available through the Commission. I wanted to pick up on the uh, comment that Monica and Corinna spoke about in terms of regional projects because I think that's a real opportunity that hasn't quite been tapped yet. There's more opportunities for regional projects now given efforts at the EU level to speed up permitting procedures, uh, projects of common interest, etc. And I'm curious through the surveys you've done and, and in the working groups, if there's any tangible examples for transition regions potentially working together to bring those projects to fruition. Because as you rightfully know, uh, many of these industries are cross-border. And so I'd be very curious if there's any examples you could speak to or, or thoughts or ideas on, on developing those regional projects further. Thank you very much. Monica? Well, uh, I think the, um, the most important and the most interesting example of the interregional and even cross-border cooperation in terms of the energy transition, but not only, is the uh, Triatral Chemical Region uh, that covers uh, Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, and Northern Westphalia in uh, Germany. And uh, there's uh, plenty of projects. Uh, they are working together. And uh, for example, the uh, hydrogen valleys uh, for, uh, between Groningen and Drenthe in uh, the Netherlands. So that's like the community that uh, works uh, together for many, many years and develop plenty of projects related to the chemical industry and to the uh, energy transition. And they are super well connected. So uh, if you, for example, interested in some particular projects, uh, of course, we can discuss this later, but definitely that's like the one of the best examples of, uh, of this interregional and cross-border cooperation, especially for the chemical industry. But uh, there are any others. And for example, even uh, our network, uh, European Chemical Regions Network, is an example of the uh, interregional and cross-border cooperation on the uh, projects related to 
the uh, chemical industry, maybe not directly on the energy transition, but for example, to the skills or to the circular economy. So there's a lot of uh, is happening right now. And uh, uh, of course, uh, it depends what are you particularly looking for? Uh, if you are looking, for example, EU-founded projects, uh, yes, we can uh, try to prepare uh, a set of such information uh, directly for you. Uh, and if you, for example, looking for some examples of uh, uh, how to manage such cooperation, of course, we can discuss because our network uh, provides several services, how to facilitate this interregional and cross-border cooperation. And in this particular case, I don't want to say it's strictly on the energy transition, but in general in the chemical industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any, any last questions, last thoughts, last observations? I have one final question for the panel. Okay, then I will just, as a closing question, really, I just want, so we've talked, you've presented the, the actions as part of the implementation plan. We've talked about, of course, the regions, because that's where the, this act, that's where the JTF is being implemented. So I just wanted to ask you, uh, a quick, uh, for your quick views on how you will be looking to the regional actors in terms of implementing the actions that, that you've identified. We've worked together here in Brussels, the working groups are meeting in Brussels, to develop these actions, but they're not going to be implemented here, they're going to be implemented uh, largely in the region. So what are you expecting uh, from the regional actors? Monica. Oh, that's a very difficult question because <laughs> it uh, depends on the regional uh, administration. We work with several European regions and uh, what we can observe that uh, it's a very different way of cooperation with uh, some of them and uh, some of them are really well connected with their local uh, regional environment with the uh, company associations and there's this uh, really a high uh, corporate culture so it's much easier to reach partners from such regions and much easier to get the information what is really happening in that regions and unfortunately that are others where uh, I would say they are mostly focused what is happening uh, inside the regional administration and uh, in many cases they do not have uh, the proper knowledge uh, about uh, the whole regional environment. So I cannot say that we can uh, get the same from all the regions and uh, we have to diversify somehow our approach and uh, of course we will try to reach uh, all of them and get as much inf information as possible but uh, unfortunately, we depend on uh, the regional administration and their capacity, their engagement, uh, their willingness to cooperate and their knowledge what is really happening on the ground. Thank you very much, Monica. Corinna, your last thoughts? Yeah, um, I can only agree we, we really depend on the capacity of um, the regional actors and the regional authorities also to um, actually involve uh, trade unions. What we do from our side is, and this is a basic uh, work uh, that we do in our day-to-day -day uh, business and uh, industry or Europe, we are there for the trade unions that we represent. Um, we, we have this dialogue with them, we try to understand and uh, that, that's a process that's been already ongoing for uh, several years now, how they are um, involving in, in just transition, not only in a, as a passive actor, but also actually um, how they are proactively engaging in the process. And uh, we, we, we always are there to, un, um, to also um, reach out with the actors on the ground to support them um, uh, as much as we can do as um, a European uh, federation, but also to, to um, sometimes, if there's problems um, in terms of uh, TGTPs, for instance, to, to get back to commission services, um, because we have also in the commission services um, uh, people that know um, the ground, that know um, the region, that know the, the country. And I think that, um, that support that we already received in the past has been very important and decisive um, in actually sometimes um, uh, supporting the actors and in getting plans and getting social plans. And we definitely uh, con will continue to do so. Thank you very much, Max. Um, I think pretty much it's all been said. Uh, continued sharing and feedback is super important. It's very easy to get 
bogged down in our own little areas, but we, we all benefit from exchange and from knowing not just good practice and how to do it better, but also what's going wrong. So uh, feedback in, in, in good and bad so that we can uh, continue to, to help each other along the way. And yeah, uh, keep up the urgency, I think I would say, as the headline. Thank you. Thank you very much. So feedback, I think that's the way you finish, which I think is a is a certainly a very good summary of everything that we're that we're expecting. We heard from the colleague. We, the reminder that the working groups are meeting uh, tomorrow. This is their tradition that they meet after the the JTP uh, conference. So the working groups will will meet and keep on uh, this work tomorrow. The implementation plan is there, but it's not the end of of the process. We're expecting now. Um, we're hoping, we expect that there will be a real contribution from the actions identified into the implementation of the plans. We've heard over the last day and a half the challenges that we face uh, in terms of implementation. We understand, I think Monica, you said it, how difficult it is. People are very busy. Um, you think, my goodness, I haven't got time to do that as well. I think we're, in, we're saying if we can make this investment together, it should be in your benefit um, in the end because you're having this experience, the sharing of expertise uh, from these colleagues across, across all of the regions. So the working groups tomorrow, we continue to thank you very much for your work and to pin our hopes uh, on, the, on the outcome of, of, of your considerations. Um, we will break now uh, and come back for lunch. Uh, sorry, we'll break for lunch and come back at two o'clock. Um, I would like to end with my huge thanks to Monica, to Corinna Mags, and to Elodie for your contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you.